Hello, my name is Jonathan Kroll. I am a undergraduate researcher studying mechanical engineering at UTA. I am working with Ali Badran, my mentor and supervisor, who is a graduate of Colorado Boulder. And I am presenting a snapshot slash update of our continued research into polymer to ceramic conversion using micro CT studies. Uh, first, some context of our previous work. Our work is based on Natalie Larson's data set. It was provided by her. Uh, she's from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, in her sample, Larson introduced SMB10 to a bed of silicon carbide fiber toes and pyrolysized the sample over the course of 20 hours, periodically taking micro CT scans of the sample, resulting in 39 2000 image stack data sets that allow for observations of changes within the sample and its microstructure over the duration of the pyrolysis process. Manual segmentation of the images was an incredibly lengthy process with time varying on how complex the images were to the segmenter. And so we decided to train neural networks or AI segmentation models to do it for us. Although being intended as an alternative or a shortcut, AI segmentation came with its own set of challenges. Uh, the first challenge is that AI segmentation still requires some amount of training data to learn from. Each image of training data taking anywhere between one to five hours to manually segment. So if you train a model off 14 training slices, that's about 42 hours of work going into a single model. Once trained, the model could segment around 2000 images in around two hours but there is that time input barrier of entry. The second challenge is that the accuracy of said trained models does not always live up to the expectation of set standards. While certain mistakes are tolerable and can be fixed or removed manually later in the process, an abundance of mistakes in the AI segmentation would lead to any sort of analysis that we draw from the results of the segmentation invalid. When we were finally done with the training, we had an all-purpose model that achieved an overall segmentation accuracy of 87%. It uh, provided an adequate segmentation of data sets at most temperatures. Uh, through our model, we were able to analyze poor networks and observing that even before pyrolysis, there was a bottlenecking occurring in the sample and preventing that certain parts of the poor network were being filled with the precursor to the matrix. We also took a look at the different types of microstructural changes happening within there. We had a focus on how prop, uh, crack propagation evolved during the extreme ends of Larson's temperature ramp and verified some of Larson's results in terms of crackage. Uh, we came to the conclusion that to reach the full potential of the data set, we would require a more accurate model. And a solution to this is rather than have one general model, an all-purpose model, we would have many unique specialized models for each of the 39 different temperature data sets. Uh, in order for this to work, we had to find out what methodology created the best AI models. The major question we wanted to answer was how much training data is truly needed to produce an effective model. The less time that we spend segmenting images to achieve the same accuracy, the better. Luckily, we were able to work with uh, the developers of Dragonfly, that is the image processing software that we use to segment image, uh, images and train models. And they were able to help us on the more coding heavy side of things so we could focus on the implementations that this had on PDC and PDC studies. To measure the accuracy of a model, we use something called the Sorensen dice coefficient. It would serve as our evaluation metric of how good a model truly was. We took a selection of four different fiber reinforced PDCs to be able to, uh, to compare and contrast the complexity of their microstructural characteristics and architectures. The four we selected are in order of the graphic in the top right corner. One, the five-phase EBC-coded PDC. This is a sample that was used previously in some of Ali's research. Number two is a synthetic PDC. Three is the PIP data sets that were provided by Natalie Larson. 
for is a 3D printed carbon fiber reinforced PDC with glass spheres inside of it. We trained different model for each PDC off one segmented slice of training data. This is also referred to as ground truth or GT in the following figures and found that more complex data sets do not train as quickly, even when compared to their own maximum achievable dice score, and that they also reach a lower dice score overall when compared to other less complex PDC data sets. How complex a data set is viewed by the AI seems proportional to the number of phases present within the sample and the uniformity of those phases. So despite the five phase CMC and 3D printed composite being the same amount of phases, the 3D printed has features that occur uniformly. The AI learns that certain phases tend to manifest in certain ways. And if you look in the figure in the bottom right, number four is the 3D printed composite. You'll notice repeating circles or spheres that are easier for the AI to segment than arbitrarily appearing pores in the five phase. We found that in comparison to the other three data sets, the PIP data set was considered third in terms of complexity. This is most likely due to the fact that a room temperature PIP data set was used and only four phases being present. This also falls in line with our hypothesis that complexity is measured on the amount of phases present as it falls in between the two phase of the synthetic data set and the five phase of the 3D printed composite. As we are working with the PIP data set, we continue to do some more investigation into how to save time in training the models for uh, PIP specific imagery. Uh, obviously, the more training volume you have, the better the trained model will perform. However, there is a distinct diminished rate of return for the more training volume you provide between the bottom one ground truth curve and the two ground truth curve, which is the next one up, there's a 20 point increase of dice score by providing just one more image of ground truth, but only a one point increase in the dice scores between the 12 ground truth and 20 ground truth curves. Now we know how many images need to be manually segmented before it's deemed not worth it anymore. But in this study, we're also looking for an alternative to manual segmentation. We're really trying to be lazy in the most efficient manner. Data augmentation is essentially computer generated training volume uh, by taking the input training images and uh, either shearing, flipping, rotating, or scaling the original images, the computer provides de facto free training data to the AI model. Each augmentation as the image is considered sufficiently changed is like adding a unique image to the input training volume. And so our results for one ground truth plus however many augmentations look incredibly similar to the one or multiple ground truth uh, graph. Comparing the achieved dice scores by the models, we can see that the 12 ground truth model has a comparable dice score to that of the one ground truth and 11 augmentation curve, despite taking roughly five times the amount of time to segment. These findings allow for the training of multiple specialized models for each of the 39 temperature data sets, rather than having to use one general model for all the different uh, data sets. Using the new models to segment fibers over the data sets, we were able to analyze and compile the found data to show that a gradual shift in fiber orientation in relationship to the viewing access occurs over the pyrolysis process. Seen on the right here, uh, overlaid with Larson's reported temperature scale during her pyrolysis process. We found the shift is most likely due to the shrinking of the matrix and the effect on poor growth and crack propagation in reference to our previous work resulting from the shift of fiber orientation is still left to be investigated once we have additional time. On the matters of future plans, the University of Utah and the AFRL, that's the Air Force Research Laboratory, conducted a joint PIP infiltration study and published it in December 2020 where they studied the change of porosity in a woven PDC sample over the course of five PIP cycles with the figures on the right displaying some of the results. 
The researcher Peter Kreveling left some excellent recommendations in the concluding paragraphs of the study on the elimination or limitation of pores in the resultant PDCs. We would like to do some work not only on his left recommendations, but with a sample undergoing multiple PIP cycles in general, mainly to analyze the resultant microstructures of various PDC architectures to provide insight into which architecture allows for better pore connectivity and therefore overall polymer infiltration. Uh, we have good segmentation capabilities now to effectively analyze the data that we collect. We know how to improve the segmentations if necessary, and we know how to achieve those faster. Uh, with the COVID-19 dangers and restrictions lessening, in-lab opportunities to work with uh, physical samples are also opening back up. So we very much look forward to that and the continuation of our research. That's it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time. That is all.